All right, good evening. Uh, I can't tell you how exciting it is to be in Maxi Auditorium here with you all and have a guest speaker here in person from out of town. This is just feeling really amazing. Um, I would like to just start by acknowledging um, the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla uh, peoples and their elders and future generations with whom we now share stewardship of the land. Um, it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, who is a good friend and an inspiration to me. Dr. Kari Marie Norgard um, started off studying biology as an undergraduate, and her passion for and concern about the environment was very evident, even um, when she was in your place. She did that work at Humboldt State University and then decided that um, she needed a better way to make an impact than uh, continuing in biology. So she switched into the field of sociology, environmental sociology, getting a master's at University of Idaho and her PhD at University of Oregon before doing a postdoc at Davis, um, U, um, University of California, Davis. Um, she has written two really interesting and important books as well as numerous articles. Her book that came out of her PhD research involved interviewing people in Norway to ask them what was their level of awareness about climate change and how was that impacting um, their daily decisions. And the title of this book is really revealing. Uh, it was called Living in Denial and um, was lauded as a, a, quote, rigorous and insightful account about a subtle and profound social problem that confronts the mitigation of climate change. Kari's work continued to try and understand why uh, we are showing such a meager response, in her words, to the problem of climate change. Her work uh, then began to intersect with the peoples of the Karuk Nation. She'll speak more about that. Um, but she has a recently published book, Salmon and Acorns Feed Our People, Colonialism, Nature, and Social Action. Um, this was a finalist uh, for a book award. She has also served as the chair of the section on environmental sociology for the American Sociology Association, ASA, right? Okay. And um, uh, more, maybe even more excitingly, co founded the section on indigenous peoples for the American Sociology Association. For her work, she has already been recognized with the Fred Buttle Lifetime Achievement Award um, in her field, which is just amazing. Um, I'm so excited that she is here tonight. Please help me in welcoming Kari Marie Norgard. What? fun to be able to be together. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kirsten. And I hope you all know what um, a treasure you have in your faculty here, especially Dr. Nicolaisen, who's been so kind, and, but many, many more of you. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but I want to start by doing something that the last time I spoke here in 2005, at the end of my very first day of teaching at Whitman, when Hurricane Katrina had just broken out, and I received two phone calls, one from Bob Carson saying, good job on my first day of teaching, and the other from George Bridges, who was then the president, asking if I would uh, speak at this panel <laughs> as Hurricane Katrina was unfolding. And at that time, uh, land acknowledgments were not done. And I'm very happy that they are done now. And, um, and so I, I, the one that I saw is a little short, so I've uh, taken the liberty of um, adding to it. Thank you for Kirsten for providing some of that. But it's important to me personally to acknowledge uh, the people and the, um, the people who've cared for and made it possible for me to be here. And for all of us in North America, 
this land has been cared for um, by intricate, uh, sophisticated knowledge holders who, um, who, who have been displaced in various ways. So for this place where we're learning today um, is the traditional, where Whitman College is on the traditional homelands of Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla peoples. Um, those peoples have been displaced um, through genocide and a series of treaties onto local reservations. Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla people continue to be here um, and uh, make co important contributions in the community um, and on this um, place for the earth and taking care of one another. So I also want to acknowledge um, elders, um, past, young people, um, and all of the indigenous peoples who are, um, and all displaced peoples who are, um, who are here now. Who, one of the reasons that this is important to do is because one of the ways that settler colonialism um, works is through erasure and through making invisible, so making that visible. And land acknowledgments are a um, way of uh, a traditional practice um, for the peoples that have cared for this place for a long time. It's something that people do when they um, introduce themselves and so forth, um, come on someone else's land. And it's also now, as they've become more common, it becomes an opportunity for us to, um, to say what that means to us. And so for me, now is an opportunity to rededicate uh, this time that I'm with you to thinking about my own ways that I as faculty can leverage my legitimacy, my resources in the service of indigenous survival and revitalization. And um, I do have a commitment to do that through my research and teaching. And I encourage all of you to think about the ways that you've each received the relationship that each of you have with settler colonialism through your own family histories in whatever way that is and the ways that you might choose to take forward uh, to do something different than some of the violence um, that surrounds us all the time in this world, including that, that form of violence. So there's a longer introduction than you might have expected. <laughs> um, so I also want to just really acknowledge and thank, um, you have amazing faculty here. And looking across the room, my dear colleague Helen Kim, who I arrived here um, in another era of each of our lives, um, was welcomed and received by Don Snow and Bob Carson, Frank Dunavit and I have published together, Phil Brick, um, Kirsten and Tim came a year after I did and have been amazing, Kirsten Nicolaes and Tim Parker. And now um, you have a wonderful new environmental sociologist, uh, Alyssa Cordner is a rock star, also all my other colleagues in sociology, Michelle Janning, Keith Farrington, um, who's no longer on campus, um, uh, Gilbert Morales. So thank you to each of you. And um, you don't wanna hear all about that necessarily, you came to hear a talk. <laughs> and um, so I, I'm gonna talk about, for a long time it felt like the things that I were thinking, was thinking about were very, very different. I did my PhD work. This is a, a, a picture from the cover of my book, Living in Denial, Climate Change, Emotions, and Everyday Life. And at the same time as I was actually, for a long time, nobody wanted to publish such a book. They said, Americans will not read an ethnography about Norway, and nobody was thinking about climate denial. So this book has had a long trajectory or long pause from when I first started that work until it came out. And now all of a sudden, lots of people want to hear what I have to say about climate denial, which, so here I am, um, which is great because it's a really big problem. And I was really frustrated that nobody else was thinking about it for a long time. Um, and then I, at the same time though I was writing this, I was actually also doing um, advocacy work for the second largest tribe in California, the Kaduk tribe. And I, that work was very, very different. It was environmental justice work that was about um, dam removal and the importance of traditional foods and indigenous lifeways in natural resource policy. So it was, I've written and just finished, actually haven't quite finished the latest one of those reports uh, that's about communicating to different uh, policyholders about um, indigenous perspectives on land management in their territory that these other agencies. And I learned a lot as I was doing that. And eventually I started seeing ways that these projects, these parts of my life that are so different were actually very connected. And so um, the talk I'll give tonight, I hope it will come together in a way that these connections make sense to you. I'm still kind of working on how to tell that story. But it is very much a story that's guided my life about how do we make sense of 
the insanity of our world? How do we make sense of the insanity of the kind of violence that we're living in, the kind of rapid social change, uh, the awareness at the same time that we're having? I don't know about um, everyone else's experience, but for me, my students, um, since COVID and since Black Lives Matter, it's like they are 10 years ahead of where people were um, in terms of their thinking about racial justice and um, the sophistication of that thinking. So that's exciting. Obviously, there's um, so many things that, so many ways that the world is changing very, very fast all the time. So how do we be, um, especially for those of us, um, myself as a non-native person, becoming increasingly aware through the work I've been doing about the ways that my own family history and my life, my wealth are implicated in the struggle that people I care deeply about face every day. And what do I, how do I make sense of that? What do I do with that? What resources do I have to uh, figure out how to create some kind of healing? And um, so that's what I'm gonna try to share some of that journey on. So I, when I was in college, back doing that undergraduate biology degree at Humboldt State, I, I took a whole class in climate change. This was in about 1989, a whole class in climate change. Uh, this is uh, James Hansen testifying before Congress in 1988 about the severity of climate change. It was on the front page of the New York Times in 1988. And, you know, that was a little while ago. Here we are now, still just, you know, things becoming so uh, frustrating. So a lot of natural scientists who I had spent a lot of time around um, were very, very frustrated about this, myself included, um, and trying to understand why is it that we are not more effectively able to respond. So this became the focus of um, my, uh, my PhD work at University of Oregon back a while ago. Um, so this sense that despite this incredible urgency, it's sort of, we're, we're just go shopping, you know. I mean, this is the life, this is the world in which we all inhabit. Awareness at this point of the urgency, the latest Working Group 2 report came out just within the last week of the IPCC, and yet living, you know, we were eating beautiful fruit <laughs> at, at, at dinner. You know, it's like, how do you make sense of a world like this? And the dominant views have really been, and unfortunately I would say continue to be, although it's changed, that if people just knew what was happening or if they only cared, that that's how we would get traction and change. And um, as a sociologist, I'm much more interested in how uh, disturbing information is, um, is masked, how it's maintained. This is a lot about social power, how social power happens as well. Um, and it's also about the struggle that each of us individually goes through to make sense of being aware of very serious things, very scary and disturbing things, and making sense of that, and how do we respond in this complex society. So I want to paint a little picture of um, the theory that I developed around how socially organized denial works. Um, but I want to really point that this is part of denial of climate change, and I'm not talking about the skeptic movement, the so-called skeptic movement. I'll make that clear in a minute. Um, but more the people who are aware that it's happening but are not doing much. Um, but so the skeptic movement has been one challenge, I think, for democracy. The questioning democracy and sort of what we've thought of as civil society has been based on the idea of facts and um, that there are certain things are true and we'll agree on those despite our value differences or other things. Um, so questioning things that have been known as, or thought of as facts is a way of interrupting that, um, interrupting that, creating alternative facts, specifically called out on day one of Trump's presidency, uh, named. Um, but there's on the left, or more mainstream, it's especially on the left, but is this also this problem of climate apathy, which I also think about very much as linked with privilege. And I wanna say a couple things about these different kinds of denial because um, Right after I left the faculty here, uh, I was told, somebody, anyway, I've been accused of a lot of very strange things that have nothing to do with what I either believe or even study. <laughs> um, and um, what mostly when people think of denial, they think of a very overt denial, like someone says, well, that's not happening. 
Um, but I'm interested in what sociologist, British sociologist Stanley Cohen talks about as implicatory denial. But so he has a literal denial, it's not happening. Interpretive denial is when you say, oh, it's not quite like that. It didn't really happen that way. And maybe you have some language to mask it, like um, sort of euphemisms and things like that that make it sort of like try to put spin on something. But implicatory denial is the kind I'm interested in, and this is the, the way of not seeing. I think it really is more the epitome of the elephant in the room, that you actually have to do work to walk around. Um, and so this is his quote, the fact of children starving to death in Somalia, mass rape of women in Bosnia, um, a massacre in East Timor, homeless people in our streets are recognized, but they are not seen as psychologically disturbing or carrying a moral imperative to act. Unlike literal, literal or interpretive denial, knowledge is not an issue, but doing the right thing with the knowledge. So I'll just say, sort of as an aside, I've done some work with Dr. Dunavit on um, uh, things around denial and awareness um, and published a variety of different things, but um, we can think about how these forms of denial you know, are operating together or, or you know, different, as I said, in different um, political spectrums. But, for me, my work has been um, looking at what looks like public apathy is, is actually a really socially complex thing that is produced in a variety of different ways. It's active, it's collective, it has to do with, you know, well, well, I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit more. Um, and there's been a lot of, and this is still true, a lot of um, survey data on climate change. I am an ethnographer or a qualitative sociologist. I like to talk to people and watch what people do, think about how that all goes into um, creating something seeming normal everyday life. So um, I spent a year uh, in Norway. Um, my beloved partner said he would come if he could ski. So we picked a town where there's a lot of skiing in Norway, so this is not hard to pick. This is my ancestry. Um, I picked Norway for a variety of reasons. Um, I had lived there and I had been very fascinated with the political cultures in Norway. It's a place where there's a really high level of environmentalism, a very high level of political engagement, a very strong stance in terms of human rights, um, and I felt like if there's anywhere that somebody, there's a kind of optimism in a way there that I have never experienced anywhere else, a kind of political optimism. And I felt like if Norwegians can't do this, <laughs> if anyone can do it, it might be Norwegians. So we spent time in this town and I spent a lot of time just watching and thinking about uh, what it was like. And I'll you know, share a few pieces around this. Um, and I, I ended up focusing on emotions, which is sort of the one piece of it, it's sort of the personal level. There's also interpersonal and structural parts. Um, but emotions are, many people who are not sociologists think about emotions as a very sort of, a, the most personal thing we have maybe. But sociologists think about emotions very much as actually at the nexus of social power. And um, that if you, we see this with um, the way that fear has been, I'll mention that in a bit later too, that fear is mobilized and triggered and can be uh, managed, um, created fear of others, of, of, you know, this is a lot of racism is clearly being created through fear. So I ended up focusing on how uh, three emotions that people probably would consider unpleasant to experience, guilt, um, fear about the future, and helplessness, how they, according to probably the most powerful theory in social psychology, the idea of cognitive dissonance, how they are avoided. We do not want to have two unlike ideas in our mind at the same time. This is true for most of us. <laughs> and um, so if you feel guilt, but we all like have a desire to see ourselves as a good person. In fact, I would say a knowing of ourselves as good people, really, despite the complexity of things. And similarly, there's like a national identity. And so this is like at odds. And so you try to manage your guilt in some way. You don't want to spend too much time there. Similarly, fear of the future is pretty freaking terrifying. Um, I don't know how many of you have had in the middle of the night, holy smokes, how are we gonna go from here? Um, how do we make sense of this? Um, and that interferes with our basic need for security. 
an ontological security, a larger sense of security. And similarly, helplessness. We actually all have a need to see ourselves as powerful actors in the world, probably especially Americans who are told that we can, you know, we're be the self-made whatever and can do anything. And so being, feeling very profoundly helpless is also a an emotion that people are motivated to avoid. So I want to go through and give, talk about how these play out to create a normalizing of climate change. And then I want to talk about these as um, also experiences of privilege. Clearly, the people that I spoke to in Norway are very privileged. And I want to then put this as a counterpoint to the community that I've been spending a lot of time with for the last 15 years, um, which is a rural um, indigenous community where people do not have the kind of resources they had in this town on the picture, and yet they are um, fighting very hard uh, for um, against climate change and to create a different future. And I want to sort of pull these pieces together and then think about, hopefully offer you all some ideas about take homes that may be useful for you. Um, but starting with some of the words of things that speaking to people. So the snow came two months late in this town, literally two months late. It's a ski town. We were all excited to ski. And they started making artificial snow. Uh, that picture that's um, on the book cover that I started with wasn't actually in our town, but that is what happened in our town, is they had bare ground and then artificial snow on one big run so that the ski area could open. And um, so people talked about, I mean, I won't say all of the methods of how I went about talking to people and when, and I tried to be like on the sly so that nobody, everybody knew who I, not everybody knew I was, but I couldn't just say I wanted to talk about climate change because um, that wouldn't have necessarily, uh, it would sort of spoiled the picture. People would have said something different because the, the thing was that they weren't talking about it and that's what I was trying to capture. Um, so in this community, despite it being very important for the economy, for uh, culturally snow, Norwegians are born as, with skis on our feet. Did you all see how many medals in the Olympics went to Norwegians? Sorry, I've got a little bit of pride. Anyway, I'll, I'll contain myself. Um, um, but I was going to start seeing if there's any other Norwegians in the room, but I decided that would be inappropriate. Um, <laughs> OK. So people talked about um, there was this political silence. And um, people talked about how, yes, they were aware of climate change. They were quite worried about it, but it wasn't something that entered every day. And I spent a lot of times in all different kinds of political venues, going to political meetings. Um, there's um, very active with multi-party system and so forth. And then I did, actually while I was here, um, finally people started thinking about climate change more. And um, I was told, yes, um, MIT Press would love to publish my book, but it, could it please have a chapter on Americans? So actually while I was here, I did some focus groups with Whitman students. And um, the one that's, um, this was a, a student um, here at the time. And so I have some interview, uh, interspersed examples of some of these emotions in people's words. And um, this was a, a person here. I find that there's a kind of guilt because of the way we live. Culturally, the way we've been raised is so contrary to our ideals in a lot of ways. You can be against global warming to a certain extent, but we're still heating our homes and driving our cars and shipping our food long distances. It's really hard to live in a social context and be aligned with your beliefs on the environment. So that's the guilt. Um, fear about the future. This was a um, man who was very active on what would be considered the, the sort of city council. Um, we have now come so far that we've begun to see to protect or not to protect the environment we're living in. In 100 years, it's possible the environment will be damaged to the point it isn't possible to live on Earth anymore, you know? And um, in terms of a sense of helplessness, um, there's a lot of people who feel that no matter what I do, I can't do anything about that anyway. Um, and then uh, this person talking about politically, that's like where I feel the most helpless. It's like, I know all this stuff. I have all this information, but what the hell do I do with it? I don't know where to turn. I don't know who to talk to. Yeah, I can write my congressman a letter, but in all honesty, I'm not sure one person can make such a difference. Anybody relate to any of these? I mean, it's just like, this is especially in the US context, I think. Um, but it's a global problem, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I ended up um, looking, so these were sort of the individual emotions. Um, but again, I, I'm often confused as being a psychologist, but I am definitely not that. I'm very much interested in thinking about social structure. And so I ended up looking at, so if these are the feelings that people have, what do they do with them? And um, looking at social norms of attention, 
How, how far into the future, into the past, across space, are you able to think? What's normal? Are people making connections between events in that town and larger? Um, social norms of conversation, can, where can they talk about it? I have a whole chart showing like what, it, what, what kind of, what, are you allowed to bring up climate change when you're at the pub? Are you allowed to bring it up when you're at a party? Are you allowed to bring it up in a political meeting? And what happens in those spaces when somebody does bring up climate change? And I encourage you to start talking about climate change and notice what happens. It's not, there's not a lot of fluency about talking about climate change. And um, that is part of how come we don't have more strong political cultures around um, solving, thinking about problems, or how to respond. Okay, um, one thing, people talked about what gets called selective attention ways. So these are all what, what sociologists call emotion management strategies. I don't wanna feel guilty, I don't wanna feel helpless, and so I am going to manage my emotions um, by not knowing everything, um, by um, not digging myself into, I can't dig myself into depression, of course not, everybody knows that, so I'm gonna control how much information I have. Um, people talk, this is again an example of um, a, a attention, not allowing myself to think so far ahead um, or across space. It's terrible to think that we live so well while others live in such miserable circumstances. Of course, it's good to have a comfortable life, I enjoy it, but I feel so bad about others. I have a guilty conscience. That's why I try not to think about it and keep it at a distance. So again, this sense of what is real and not real. I also spent a little bit of time um, uh, looking at ways that uh, things are normalized or justified. Um, so uh, let me tell you, people around the world get a lot of mileage about not, uh, by not being as bad as we are. Um, the U.S. is still, although we're not the largest emissions, uh, we're still the cumulative uh, largest. Um, and um, the sense that Norway is just, it's just, we're just little Norway, you know, never mind that we're one of the largest um, oil exporters um, in the world and producers, but Norge er et lite land, we're just a little country. Um, and then also a sense of Norwegians as really sort of being simple and close to nature. So there's the child on skis, with the sort of old fashioned skis even, and just this sense of Norwegians, very simple people. There's also what, um, this is, I'm drawing on the work of Robert Lifton, who looked at justifications that uh, Nazi doctors had for giving lethal injections to Jews. And he talked about this idea of claims to virtue, ways that this was justified. I'm very interested in ways that power is being normalized or people's choices are being normalized. And I encourage you to think about that yourselves. Um, so Norway has these claims to virtue. Well, gas isn't as bad. They're developing two natural, at the time, two natural gas plants. Um, or Norwegian oil is, oil is cleaner, and so therefore we should do these things that are increasing production um, when Norway is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It probably has the capacity more than anyone else to do some different things. Okay. Talky, talky, talky. It's like, gosh, talking a lot at you all, but hopefully it's worth it. <laughs> Um, this is not my normal mode. If you take a class with me, I won't stand and talk this long, but. Um, so, okay, so um, basically the model of socially organized denial that I developed, drawing on insights from other people as well, um, has this three sociologists talk about social power happening at the individual level, at sort of the meso level of culture and social um, and um, social interaction and then at the more macro level of political economy. And essentially, this silence, this apathy of, um, of, of around climate change is happening um, on, on multiple levels. So there's the individual emotions I mentioned, the sort of cognitive dissonance. There's what you can talk about in different spaces and how there's all these tools for managing emotions um, provided to you by um, uh, the, the common discourse, these phrases that you can just use that are like, of course, everybody knows Norway's just a little country instead of, yes, Norway's one of the largest natural gas exporters, and, I mean, excuse me, um, oil exporters. And then similarly, just like the United States, uh, our, our political economy, our nation is oil dependent. Um, our, it, it, it runs on that. So it is very difficult for us to get off of it and um, reorganize our whole um, system And so the government, which is, of course, is a one very powerful mechanism of social change is a national government is, is very difficult for people who get into power to do so. And we see this um, now. 
Okay, so turning a little bit, I want to say sort of two things. I want to um, juxta start juxtaposing what I saw there in terms of the denial and, um, and think about what, what, what can we do. And I think it's also related to um, apathy is a form of social suffering. It is not a comfortable position to be terrified or feel really bad and not be able to talk or do something about it. It is very satisfying for those of you who've been in the streets, um, you know, and if you haven't been, I encourage you to do it. It is satisfying and fun and to be together with other people. And so this is also, how do we move beyond denial is also about how do we make meaning in our lives? How do we live a good life in, in, in an ethical way? And here I'm thinking kind of tying back also to this theme we're getting to around responsibility um, for myself as a non-native settler, thinking about responsibility and what I've gleaned from um, my Karu colleagues. So for one thing, I mentioned we don't talk a lot about climate change. We do not have a strong political culture in this country, um, although we have had, and there are pockets of it, about really what do we do. And so we have all these discourses about recycling and, and people think, you know, we're going to respond to climate change. It means we're going to um, never take a hot shower again. Like, it's just, it's like, it's, there's nothing in between. And um, this, is, this is a problem <laughs> because, it, you know, you're not going to get very far if you try to respond to climate change through recycling, um, through uh, riding a bike. Um, and it, um, although those are great things to do, don't get me wrong, they are just not at the scale um, of the response that we need. And so this further um, comes to, um, creates a sense of hopelessness and denial. Um, and so as a sociologist, I think we have to have very real discussions about the seriousness of climate change, um, how society works, which people who benefit or have benefited historically, or do benefit still some from the system as it is, which all of us definitely do in this room, it is harder to have a social critique of it. Um, and then it's harder also to think about um, how we can, um, um, how, uh, we need to have a real discourse about how we can mobilize. We need to have those stronger uh, political cultures. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn to um, my dear friend Ron Reed, who has spoken on this campus. Many of you have met him. Um, and um, he's a Karuk uh, tr traditional uh, fisherman, uh, medicine person, and um, my very brilliant uh, colleague in much of my work for the last 15 years. I've learned a huge amount um, from him and has impacted three generations of my family. And um, this is him at his home property, the place that his family is from at Tea Creek on the Klamath River. So, I was doing some uh, policy work for the tribe. I think it was um, work on knowledge sovereignty in the face of climate change. And um, sort of sat down next to Ron's desk and I said, well, what do you think we should be doing or what do you think needs to go into this? And um, I think I, I have the tape recorder on as much as possible when I'm near him because he's constantly saying amazing things. And this is one of the things that he just said that really impacted my life and my career. And, he says, we're trying to get back to an intact world. Climate change can be a vehicle for that because of the awareness it brings to so many about limitations in the current management practices. We believe there's genuine interest in cutting perspectives about how to care for the land, and we offer these explanations in the hope that this is true. So he right there is changing climate change from this sort of dead end, doom and gloom, we are all going to die, um, to an opportunity as serious as it is, it is an opportunity. And um, that is actually how he's ex been experiencing it. And that's true, other Native people um, that I know and have read his work have, have spoken about that. And I wanna give just a couple examples of, um, of this work. So I know there's big fires here, what that, what that has looked like in that place, and then talk about broader lessons, I feel like from indigenous perspectives, um, offer to thinking about climate change and climate denial and, and some of these things we've been talking about. Um, so I know there's been big fires here. Um, we had in 2020 huge fire season. This is a pyrocumulus cloud that 
lit spot fires at great distances. Large portions of the Klamath uh, have burned increasingly. It is very dangerous. I've been, had to be evacuated myself in the times that I spend there. And everybody who lives there has had to be evacuated um, probably multiple times. Um, it is uh, very large fires that become a reality. And um, there's a variety of reasons for this. I actually flipped my slides. I wanted to acknowledge, um, I didn't get um, the, uh, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the people I've been working with. Um, Ron is on the bottom there, Ron Reed, also um, in Kadok DNR. Um, on the left is Bill Tripp, who's currently the director of Department of Natural Resources, the Kadok Department of Natural Resources. He is also a cultural practitioner and um, a lead for a lot of work on fire specifically, and um, has, was my co-author on the tribe's uh, climate change plan that I'll have a slide of in a minute. On the top is Frank Lake, who is a research ecologist. He's Kaduk descendant and um, is an indigenous practitioner and also a Western trained scientist. And then on the right is Leif Hillman, who was a founder of the Kaduk DNR and um, ceremonial leader and a, um, uh, yeah, he was, was for a very long time the director, was the director under uh, many of those times. So these um, four and many, many others, extraordinary people are people that have been um, people that I've learned from and I'll try to, try to do well to represent the things that um, I have gained. So I did work on, um, the tribe has been doing work specifically on fire and on bringing indigenous fire back to the land. And, um, so when Ron talks about the, um, uh, the opportunity and the fact that there's genuine interest in indigenous perspectives about land management, he's speaking about many things, but he's speaking very specifically about fire. And the, this climate plan um, that's here, it looks like I didn't get the current, uh, the best slide because it's no, been out for some time, it's not a draft. Um, is, um, is essentially about reintroducing fire. And it has all kinds of wonderful information about indigenous science and Western science. And it was an incredibly exciting um, project to work on. I'll say a couple more things about the content there. But what I'm moving towards is thinking about some of the learning that I've taken from that work to the larger world about how climate change uh, the, the movement towards indigenous revitalization, the movement towards Black Lives Matter, all of these issues, um, all of these things that have been happening in our world in very dramatic ways can be opportunities um, to rethink our relationships. Relationality is incredibly important um, in the, as I understand it, in indigenous contexts. And so relationships with fire, place, each other, the future, I'll give a few examples. Um, this, you don't need to read all this text, but this is Kathy McCovey, who is um, a cultural practitioner and a firefighter and an um, archaeologist. And um, she's one of the people who has a lot of fire expertise and cultural expertise uh, using fire there. So thinking about um, relationships with place and how when these big fires happen, there is a story that is happening. There's a story that we need to listen to. I, um, I, in Eugene, I, I wanted to write an op-ed and I've just been too busy. I haven't actually written it as an op-ed, but it, the smoke is awful when it's really thick. We had very, very high, I don't, didn't look up what, what you may or not have had here in Walla Walla, but we had very, very high parts per million. It is not healthy to be outside, all these things. I talk about that as this is the smell of colonialism. This is the smell of colonialism because this is the, this is the fire exclusion that's happened because of genocide, that's happened because there were amazingly sophisticated indigenous management practices in that place, in this place, and those were interrupted through genocide. And that um, violence, this is, um, I will read this quote, this is from when the Klamath National Forest was established. Um, this is from um, uh, the district ranger at the time um, advocating killing people for setting fires, which are incredibly vital cultural and ceremonial responsibility for those people to conduct. So he says there's another source of the fires, which I will call the renegade whites and Indians. There were the white people, some pe white people were like, hey, this is, makes sense, we'll do it too. They set fires for pure cussedness or in a spirit of don't care a damnedness. They have nothing at stake and don't care whether the fire damages others or not. In the pure cussedness class, the only sure way is to kill them off. Every time you catch one sneaking around in the bush, like a coyote, take a shot at him. 
And I want to also have a couple more. This is another quote from Ron about how political sovereignty, mental health are all linked to that brush coming up. So he says, without fire in the landscape, it changes dramatically. And in that process, the traditional foods that we need for sustainable lifestyle become unavailable after a certain point. So what does that do to the tribal community? The reason we're going back to that landscape is no longer there. The spiritual connection to the land is altered significantly when there's no food, when there's no food for regalia species that were dependent upon food and fiber, when they're not there, for the, there's no food for them, there's no, food, there's no reason to go there. And I don't know how familiar everyone is with forest ecology, but this is an example of the kind of place he's talking about. You can't walk through it because of fire suppression. When we don't go back to the places we're used to, our custom, part of our lifestyle is curtailed. So you have health consequences. Your mental health aspect of life is severed from the spiritual relationship with the earth, with the great creator. We're not getting the nutrition that we need. We're not getting the exercise that we need. And we're not replenishing the spiritual balance that creates harmony and diversity through the landscape. So this is the kind of, and, and it burns. It burns and makes a lot of smoke. And that is the smell. For those of us who, uh, our connection to this process may be through smelling that smoke and listening to the story that tells there. And I think of it as a responsibility, calling us as a, on that responsibility of what do we do with this. So I didn't talk a lot about, the, so there's a lot of things one could say, um, but indigenous cultures um, across North America um, emphasize relations. They re emphasize species as kin, other beings as kin, as family, um, and a sense of responsibility. And those are qualities that shaped the abundance that all of us have benefited from in this place. Those, those values, those qualities. And um, so how might they apply to me as a third generation non-native white girl who is running around with a PhD in their landscape? <laughs> what can I take from that? Um, and one thing I'll notice is we have a lot of a discourse around rights, my right to do this, my right to do that, but not as much about what responsibility do I have to the people that nourished me to the people who care for me, to the beings that care for me. Um, I mentioned that we don't have a particularly uh, hefty discourse about what can be done. And part of it's because we don't really want to critique the system. But if you are a Native person, this system is clearly not, has clearly been set up around your elimination, your destruction. And so the idea, the ability to critique, and also there's a lot of resource of existing alternatives that have not been eradicated that still function in how people conduct themselves, including ethics of generosity, um, ethics of care. Um, okay, so I, climate change for all of us, I think, is an opportunity to reimagine, to really critique. If Ron wants us to wake up and notice that there are real problems and actually climate change is an opportunity because a few of us seem to be saying, oh yeah, it really is not working, then what do we start to do from that point? How do we link climate change as an ongoing situation of intensified capitalism, an ongoing um, aspect of colonialism this ongoing reorganization of the world into bits and pieces that we have rights to rather than beings that we care for and we have responsibilities to care and tend to. And um, we can think about the kind of political power that comes from um, doing, uh, from changing the conversation. I mentioned, you know, I love the work of Hannah Arendt um, and her thinking about power, um, and she talks about unlike strength, power is not a property of an individual, but of a plurality of actors joining together for some common political purpose. Unlike force, it is not a natural phenomenon, but a human creation and outcome of collective engagement. It's thinking about uh, when we get together, when we talk, when we care for each other, um, how we can um, change conversations. So thinking about this as ethics that are in other traditions as well. 
coming actually out of the traditions of other communities that have faced genocide in terms of, um, of power. Okay, now this is a part, I'm, I'm, hopefully I'll sort of wrap this up in a smooth way because this is a part where um, I've been fidgeting with the slides up until the end. Um, okay, so if denial is this um, politics of fear um, and, you know, and victimhood, or if denial is, um, ha has all of these things, is also related, I think, to a politics, uh, to privilege and to a politics of fear that we are really um, in right now. And I really like this cartoon about um, I can't breathe and I can't see, you know, this sense of um, the links there because we are now um, very much in a politics of fear. Um, and it's easy to be afraid because the world is changing very fast. There are many, many things to be really afraid of. Um, but how does it benefit if we, if we come from that place? But if we think about denial as linked to privilege and linked to fear and our ability, again, to be manipulated in those ways. Um, yeah, sorry, this, I'm gonna keep. Um, so if silence is complicity as well, how does that um, tell us about sort of the dominant political cultures and the depth to which we need to be um, changing and looking at traditions, um, traditions from African-American organizing, traditions from indigenous organizing that are really taking very strong um, social critiques. And um, here I have just a few of the people that I've been sort of learning from and teaching in their work. Laura Polito's on the faculty at University of Oregon, Leanne Simpson, David Pello, um, who are also doing really um, important thinking about um, moving, beyond, uh, moving beyond the politics of fear, thinking about how a lot of what we're seeing is really embedded in white supremacy, and, um, and, and which we're obviously seeing and using that um, um, terms much more frequently. But if we look and start again, thinking about from what um, I've been learning from indigenous perspectives, indigenous peoples, by contrast, are not in this, I mean, again, to not to uh, entirely overgeneralize, but we see through Standing Rock, we see through political mobilizations against other pipelines, we see people who have some of the least access to, uh, to the highest levels of power until recently, um, a little bit now with Deb Holland um, and the um, cook in the Park Service, um, people are not being paralyzed. People are um, very radically engaged, very mobilized. And so how can that um, politics of responsibility um, uh, be, um, be mobilized um, for, for others? How do, we, how do we begin to mobilize that for ourselves? And it makes me leave with a question for each of you. Um, if we've had a politics of denial, and denial, uh, denial is a politics about fear, what does, what does each of our politics of love look like? How do we move, how do we move beyond that? And I want to, again, moving back to this, think about that we have opportunities to rethink our relationship with place. As you see that smoke happening, as you learn and tell the stories about what happened in this place, the history of Whitman College, for example, the history of Walla Walla, what are those relationships of place? Those are opportunities. We have opportunities to think about how we're gonna see the future, what actions we're gonna take there, because by all means, clearly, there's gonna be much more um, fire in the future. How do our land management practices of the past need to change? So these are, uh, this is what I see partly as a politics of love, if you will, um, is rethinking many of these, rethinking our relationships um, with one another and um, the op opportunities for collaboration, for building bridges in ways where we've been taught that we're very different, and um, our opportunities to think about our, our relationships with the earth and um, the ways that... Um, uh, the ways that we can care for each other. I'm just going to cut here because I have, I feel like the less of this is just getting, I'm going to have a few more things I could say, but I just wanted to um, wrap it up there. So essentially what I wanted to, what I want to leave with you is ideas that as non-Native people, for those of us who are, climate change can also be an opportunity to really reimagine the world 
Um, if denial is something that's held together in, um, in through individual f emotions of fear, through the middle kinds of things of our social norms, of our, of our political structure, and these kinds of things, and through our political economy at the larger level, it means that there are actually many ways that we can interrupt that. Depending on where you are, you will be at different moments in your life in different ways, have different kinds of opportunities to interrupt it. There is a lot of urgency around climate change for obvious reasons. But what we are looking at has been built the way it is over a very long period of time. And it is extremely naive to think that um, it's just going to change quickly. But I think what we can notice is that the world is changing very fast now. Lots of things there are, as, as you know, with new um, political administrations, um, with new configurations in the streets, with COVID, I feel like people's political imagination has really um, moved forward very fast. We have an intimate understanding of our connectedness with one another, that there are and will be a series of opportunities throughout each of our lives to step up and use the privilege that you have in a particular way in a particular moment. And for those of us who are settlers on this land, that ethic of responsibility and of care and of generosity um, is really an, an ethic that um, we can also embrace and um, utilize. And I know that it's not that indigenous cultures are not the only ones that do that. Um, but I want to encourage you to think about not the politics of fear, but the politics of responsibility and um, opportunity that comes in the midst of the crisis, the many multiple crises that we're in. So thank you for having me and thank you for your time. Oh gosh, these are fun. I don't know if you can start. Seriously? Okay. <laughs> um, I think I'll pick up this microphone. We have time for some questions. Uh, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Okay. Do we have a question? Okay. I think this works. Um, you said that one of the most effective things we can do is start to have these serious, widespread discussions about climate change. But with so many people fa like dealing with the apathy and ignorance around climate change, how would you get those discussions to even start in the first place? It's going to be awkward. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. And I wouldn't say that it's the most necessarily the most effective thing. Um, I think there are many different things that are effective, um, but I, I think it is an overlooked piece, and it is a piece that all of us have access to. And um, I think that the, the lack of conversation is part of what is creating that sense of isolation and helplessness. So, um, and I think your question was sort of how, how do we go about it? Um, I mean, I think that, the, it, you know, people do, um, you know, do book groups, you can raise it, you can talk about the awkwardness of talking about climate change. Have you ever noticed? You know, I have had people who've read different works of mine do classroom assignments where they have students raise these conversations and then watch what happens. Um, but I think it's also important to be, I want to say, I want to say be gentle with each other. Like, Yes, it is serious. Yes, we are culpable. Yes, we have responsibility. And it, the, the um, awkwardness, the fear, the, all of these things are real and they are real barriers. And we didn't just come up with them ourselves. Like it's, it, it, we're in a, it's a widespread situation that we're in. And so um, if, it's, if it feels awkward, I mean, in my I Teach My Environmental Justice class, I'm like, it's going to be awkward. We're going to talk about really unpleasant things. There's going to be awkward moments where people um, are unthoughtful with one another and get upset with each other. And that is how change happens, how we learn, is by going up against sort of our comfort zone. So, um, yeah, I mean, you say, have you ever noticed how climate change is difficult? Or start with yourself. It, you know, I'm afraid or I'm trying to figure out what to do. Definitely in terms of, you know, uh, joining, I understand there's been a sunrise uh, movement happening here. I know there's a lot of, I don't know whether there's a, th there's a 350 chapter formed in Eugene um, when, I, I, when I first moved there and it has been this phenomenal burgeoning, you know, there's many different um, organizations going to things with friends um, can be really good, inviting people to go, go to something. 
And yeah, and give yourself breaks from talking about it too. It's also, um, you know, incredibly fun to, uh, important to have fun and, um, you know, experience joy. I, I've been really um, excited about Ayanna Johnson's work. Um, I'm forgetting the title of her book right now. Um, All We Can Save, she talks about the importance of sort of finding your own skill set and also having fun doing things. But yeah, that's a, a couple of ideas. Hi, um, Ryan, I'm an environmental sociology major. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in this age of where climate doomerism is a very big um, I ideology, especially in our own generation, yeah. and especially within the realm of trying to co combat that and uh, you know provide a little bit more hope, especially since there's a lot of evidence that that ideology was created by Shell Corporation. Um, how, you also kind of mentioned that the man that you mentioned, he kind of talks about um, Native Americans' ideology, it kind of parallels cli uh, climate doomerism, um, uh, uh, more in the fact that you mentioned he uh, uh, Native American uh, uh, relatives kind of uh, approach climate change with the fact that, oh, the world is ending, how, how does our ideology shift to, to match that? I was just wondering uh, your thoughts on the similarity between that ethic and uh, climate doomerism. I just, I miss, who are you saying, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize, I, miss, I must have missed part of your question. Who, who are you saying, um, could you, would you be able to repeat what you asked? Yeah, so I, I'm asking um, if you can speak on the similarity of climate doomerism and the, the, your Native American uh, friend, My friend yeah. who uh, kind of has the ethic along the lines of meeting climate change with, uh, straight on, but more in the fact that um, the world is dying in a way, yeah. and how those, those two ideologies differ and okay. uh, why one might be uh, better than the other. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's like we're in, um, you know, I didn't believe I would live to be 25 when I was in high school. I, um, so that's sort of partly that sense of, I wanted to say that sense of doom, which is so much more widespread, which all of you who are younger have grown up with in a very different way, even than I grew up with it because my closest friend, her father was trying to stop the arms race that I was hearing constantly about two minutes to midnight and all of that. And I, didn't, I thought we were gonna be going down a nuclear war any, any moment. But, um, but now it's a different, very much connected with climate change. And so I just wanna acknowledge like that, um, that sense of you know, loss of childhood or whatever um, you want, however you wanna think about it. Um, it's, it, it makes sense. I think all of us have to uh, come face to face with that sense of, yeah, the, it is precarious. There is no guaranteed outcome by any means uh, that is going to be good. In fact, no matter what happens, a lot of really hard things are going to happen. And so how do we make sense of it? Um, Ron, I don't think Ron Reed and other like Kyle White, if you haven't read Kyle White's work, I highly encourage he's a Potawatomi philosopher. Um, I don't think that they're saying um, that the world is ending exactly as much as it has been ending for a long time. Like, like Native people are not supposed to still be here. That's why we don't have land acknowledgments. That's why, you know, because there's this whole ethic of erasure. And so if you are from a community who has been fighting uh, in that way for your survival, for decades or centuries, you may have learned a thing or two about how to fight in the face of that kind of, uh, um, what's the word, you know, uh, future or that kind of, um, when you're, what the, being up against that. And, and it, so it's not this sort of moment crisis that for many of us who uh, were raised to believe that this is, I mean, my grandfather said to me, I was in the streets in Seattle in the 99 protest and my grandfather's like why are all these young people protesting the world is getting better and better that was his experience 
And um, so for those of us who are more privileged, who have received much of the benefits and wealth of the system as it is, it, it has appeared like all of a sudden we are now falling off the cliff and oh my God, what do we do? And so there is that sense of doom. But for communities who have long been struggling, then it's, it doesn't look like that at all. And, and there's a lot more. In fact, for many of my native colleagues, the world is, getting, is actually now getting better because there is some more advancement of indigenous practices of uh, you know, sovereignty, these kinds of things that were never there before. Ron is the first person to go, his parents were in boarding school. He's the first person to be raised in public schools. His mother was taken as a child um, against, you know, and, and you know, anyway, so you, you know some of these kinds of stories. So, um, so I would say that it's not that either are saying that our, our, our survival is guaranteed, but traditions for whom this comes as sort of a shock, who don't have a political culture of fighting like many white Americans um, versus people who have come from a tradition of, of struggle. Is that, is that, yeah. yeah. All right. Kari, you used the term falling off a cliff as you answered the last question. I think the, you have to add to uh, apathy and, and lies. I think you have to add the fact that it isn't happening fast enough. Right. Uh, we didn't do anything when Germany took over Czechoslovakia. It took Japan bombing Hawaii. Yeah. Um, Climate change is probably the greatest crisis the Earth has ever faced. We can have Texas go without power, severe wildfires, uh, hurricanes on the Gulf Coast, and severe forest fires in the West all in one year, and it really, we really don't do anything. What would it take to, I mean, you mentioned having meetings and things like that, but what would it take for us to get serious about climate change? It's happening so slowly that it doesn't shock us. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think we have gotten more serious. You know, I mean, we have seen more mobilization. You know, it, it, I was like, I'm going to lock down at my professional organization if the presidential address doesn't include climate change. And finally, it did, you know. Um, but similarly, a presidential election has not been a you know, campaign issue or any of these things, finally now more so. Um, so there has been change. But yes, it is absolutely, that's, again, the, you know, the thing that got me to my dissertation work is it is absolutely not on par with what is needed. And, um, you know, I don't know that there's like a silver bullet answer of what it will take. I agree that frog in the boiling water problem is real. Um, I think similarly, when you look at other social issues which are urgent and egregious and you know, for a long time, do not seem to move. You know, it can be very, um, dis, you know, demoralizing. Um, you know, I think that we are living in a time when things are happening very fast, and I think that there are many things that can happen, hopefully will happen, to cause those kinds of changes. But I think if you read Naomi Klein's um, work on um, her book, "This Changes Everything," she has a chapter called "The Right Is Right." Like some people are doubling down on resources and the system that it is, um, as it is, rather than trying to think about larger scale change. And um, that is also one of the things that's, you know, that is happening in this moment, which is causing a lot of political divide. So whether we can, and we don't have a, a reasonable alternative in terms of government structures, right? You know, we don't have um, a real clear answer. There's plenty of solutions. and. Dr. Dunavit here, Frank, in you know, front of you, has written about a lot of them. We have plenty of things we could do in terms of technology, in terms of all these things, but it really is on the um, social structure side. And I think a lot of it has to do with fear and, um, and people who have political power um, operating from a place of fear in different ways. Let's just take one or two more questions. I want to give this side of the room a chance. Any questions over here? But, and I will say, well, if there's anyone that else is, that there is um, your life, there, I, I believe, I, I feel like there is, um, and if you've read Rebecca Solnit's A Paradise Built in Hell, um, our quality of life is not as intricately tied 
to, and our sense of happiness and even our health is not as intricately tied to GDP as the powers would have us be. And it is, it is possible to have a much more meaningful life um, if by giving up you know, certain things that one might think one wants and um, you know, just making different choices. So even though, it's, even though it is not necessarily clear that there'll be a winning situation it is worth, in my mind, um, being a part of the struggle, and you will have a better life um, you know, for doing that. And there's so many ways, especially with a, coming out of a degree at Whitman, there's so many um, ways that you can and that you will, people in this room will be involved in caring for each other and creating change. Okay, as we wrap up, I would just like to take a moment to thank the people I forgot to thank, which are um, the people who helped make Kari's visit possible, which is the Environmental Studies Program, the Sociology Department, um, the General Studies Program, the Geology Department, and um, the Dean of Students, or sorry, Dean of the Faculty all contributed to help bring Kari here. I'd also like to invite you to a movie that we will be screening called Once You Know. We will be screening it in this room on Thursday, March 31st. That's the first Thursday after spring break. And we will have a panel. Uh, that panel is being formulated. Um, but right now uh, there are at least three of us on that panel so I invite you to come to the film once you know as a way to continue the conversation please do continue to check the academic theme page to see all of the wonderful events that we have on climate change um, this year so can we please thank <laughs> Kari <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me as I merge things in my first in-person talk in a couple years. It wasn't perfect, but I, I appreciate being with all of you.